Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 11 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. I hope you're having a great weekend. I certainly am. We've got a fantastic guest for you today, uh, one of my personal idols, producer and director Martin Wood. He is with us today. But before we get started, if you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you click that like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will help the show grow its audience. Please also consider showing this video with a, sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops, and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. So this is key if you plan on watching live, because these talent are working and things can shift all the time. And clips from this live stream, if I can get my button gear here, will be released over the course of the next several days on both the Dial the Gate and, you and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. That's all I've got for you. Before we bring in Martin Wood, uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, catch up with him a little bit, ask him some questions. Then I'm going to bring in uh, uh, your questions from the live stream. And then we will go and show, after we let Martin go, I'm going to show you some Stargate art that was submitted by a Mr. Max Becco. Uh, big thanks to Linda the Gate Gabber for all her work in setting up social and, you know, getting the word out. Summer, Ian, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy, you moderators are fantastic. I'm looking for your questions. And without further ado, director, producer, man of the hour, Martin Wood. Wow, I've never been a man of the hour before. This is great. <laughs> Uh, I, I doubt that. I didn't dress for man of the hour stuff. No, it's all good. How are you, my friend? I'm really good. I'm really good. How is this nightmare of 2020? How, how have you been dealing with it? Are I you staying in production? I am always guilty. Um, I always feel guilty when people ask me how I'm dealing with it because um, I actually, I would never have given myself the time off that I took off because I was in the middle of a movie and and uh, we're told tomorrow we're done. And I kind of went, yes. <laughs> it, had been, it had been straight through. I took Christmas off and I'd been, uh, I was finishing this big Netflix movie that is about to drop. Okay, um, we'll talk about it. Um, and, uh, um, and I was just trying to finish that. And I was in another production and, uh, and the fact that it was, uh, you have to take some time off now. And there was nothing I could do at that point other than come home and have the family sort of gather. Um, I never take time like that uh, to myself. I, it, it, it was guilt-free time that I could take to myself. And uh, it was the first time in probably 10 years I'd taken that much time off. And uh, loved it. Loved it. <clears throat> it has been a struggle for a lot of people this year. And simultaneously in the struggle, I have... I. I um I do Uber and Lyft on the side just to keep myself sane and get out and see people. And uh, I have lost track of the number of people who tell me, you know, it's been the hardest year, but it's also one that my family and I are going to remember for the rest of our lives exactly. because everything came to a halt. We had no choice and we either pulled together and made it work or collapsed and there I'm sure there's going to be record divorces when this is over but at the same time you know all, we we've also had a chance to catch up with the people that we care about the most oh i have i i had a um a daughter who graduated university i had a daughter that was in boarding school and and i i was missing i had and my son was home but but still going to school and the fact that they were back here um uh, and the house is big enough to sort of take everybody back in without us feeling on top of each other. And again, like I said, I feel guilty about it all the time because so much of what's happened has been hardship for so many people. But uh, but honestly, for my life, I, I, I needed time away from work. I needed time away from having to think about work. And, uh, and that time to spend with my family was uh, at, at this age when they're teenagers and what they're doing is spilling out of the house to bring them back in and nobody felt it was uh, um, it was uh, there was pressure for for them to have to perform for any reason at all. It was it was a it was a, a gift. Yeah. Well, Martin, I want you to think about some work now. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this Netflix project. Oh, I, it's a it's a um, Netflix feature that I, I uh, got offered uh, about a year and a half ago, 
And what attracted me was it's an Air Force movie. Um, <laughs> and what's really interesting is that uh, that uh, I uh, um, I really really love working with the Air Force. So when I was at uh, at Stargate, um, being able to do the things that we we were able to do with the Air Force, and then uh, and and then with the Navy, when the Navy came up and said, "Hey, you know, you guys want to go on a submarine?" Exactly. Like, um, it's just it was uh, it's it's. It's so much fun to be able to to work with that kind of uh, equipment and gear, um, and people that are so wonderfully nice about it too. They're, they're um, we did a, a movie called Operation Christmas Drop, um, and uh, it's an it's an actual mission that has been uh, run for 68 years now, 69 years, out of uh, Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. So I spent a couple of months in Guam. Um, uh, wrapped a love story around this uh, uh, this uh, mission that gets flown there, and were amongst some of the, the nicest people I've ever worked with. Um, they'd never had a movie done in Guam before, um, and Guam is essentially um, it's the Chamar people and an Air Force base and a naval base, um, sort of the uh, power projection point for the U.S. Uh, yeah, it's a little strip of land in the ocean. I've landed on it on the way to the Philippines, and yeah. that was it. I mean, it's a little blip. And that's the tip of the spear for uh, for the U.S. military. Um, you know, they call it the unsinkable aircraft carrier. Um, and in a time when all the stuff that's going on around there is going on around there, it was quite a it was quite an exciting time to be in Anderson. And the fact is, we were there with the people who had done this mission. Um, you know, um, Brother Bruce, who who um, has coordinated this thing for for more than forty years was there and we got to meet all the people. And then they said, uh, we're, we're, we'll take you up and we'll wrap a mission around so you guys get to go up. And we shot in the, uh, you know, actually dropping stuff out of the back of the C-130s. And it was a really amazing um, movie to do. Uh, Alexander Ludwig, Cat Graham, um, and okay. a number of the, uh, the people that I've, I've so enjoyed working with over the years. Um, a lot of local uh, BC people that I took with me. I took a BC crew with me because again, Guam has never had a movie done. They've never had anything feature-wise done there. And so we sort of carried everything in our backs um, uh, to do this. And I was able to use a, a BC crew with me uh, uh, that we sort of were able to hand pick and take with us. Michael Blundell, who, who actually was the director of photography for uh, Atlantis, uh, was with me. And uh, um, uh, we had such a great time. It comes out November 5th on, on Netflix. The, uh, the um, trailer for it's up already and it's just a, it's a lot of fun and again that the, the air force element is what actually got me to do the movie wow okay november the 5th all right i'll post the uh the trailer link operation christmas drop yes no. is it a supply drop or is it it uh is uh something that happened uh that they it was it was a uh, by accident they sort of looked out the, the window and thought wouldn't it be interesting to be able to take uh, Christmas gifts and drop them to these uh, atolls and uh, to the Micronesian atolls and islands around there. And now uh, it is a massive operation and it is all donated time, donated goods. Um, the military actually doesn't get involved until um, uh, there's an accord signed with the group that does this, but it's all military people that are donating their time. It's really, it, it is such an amazing humanitarian effort uh, to do this every year rain or shine war or not they they have done this thing and they drop you know um and i can't remember the exact number it was something like 156,000 pounds of, of supplies um and it's not christmas gifts necessarily there are there are some things in there that would be considered functional exist, stuff it's uh, mosquito netting and yeah. and uh, fishing netting and um you know uh things that they can uh, uh and rice and stuff that uh, that they need um um uh, and these people depend on this stuff because those islands are being hammered by global warming right now. Just the seas are rising and their, uh, their ability to be able to, to uh, make their own food, you know, grow taro um, is being affected by the fact that there's uh, all this salt water coming in. So they're more and more dependent on this. And uh, it's a really wonderful thing that, uh, that, this, uh, that the Air Force has been doing for years and years and years. I can't wait to see it. Who are your heroes, Martin? Who are responsible for making you into um, the person that uh, that you've become? Wow. Okay. You warned me that you were going to ask me this question. <laughs> I did. 
Um, my heroes. My dad is my hero. My my, my dad ah. is always. And I mean, that sounds. It's it's one of those oh shucks kind of moment thing. But uh, quite honestly, he was uh, he was very much a hero for me. He got me involved in in television. He didn't want me to work in television. He <laughs> got me involved in television. Um, and um, uh, I mean, it's just it's just. Um, that father figure for me is always such an amazing part of, of, you know, when I write, I write with that in mind. I, I, um, I try and raise my kids with that in mind. And, and so that would have to be, uh, my dad would have to be, you know, uh, my number one hero in my life. Um, I, I find that I have um, different heroes that change, you know, artistically, there's some, some directors that I find that I really, really enjoy watching, um, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that are, uh, it, more than just the style that they shoot with, it's it's the way that they um, they tell a story, and uh, and uh, their work ethic is is some of it too uh, is a big part of it for me. So I, I like that. I wouldn't necessarily call them heroes, but I, I do uh, look up to their directing and directing style. And as directors, that's that's sort of what I'm I'm aiming for a you know um, um, uh, a higher bar. Uh, because of directors that uh, that I, I sometimes will follow, um, uh, it's it's hard for me to sort of say, um, as I said, because my heroes change all the time. There's there's different people that have have, uh, have always been, you know, those those people that you you are attracted to and things. This, I got to say that that um, um, uh, uh, some of the the showrunners that I've worked with, like Brad Wright and Robert Cooper, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know, um, uh, Paul and Joe and those guys, the, the, the work that they put into a series like this and then in subsequent series that they've done that I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've, sort of, I've been touched on or I have touched on with them and things as I, I really appreciate and, um, and, and, uh, love to watch that kind of work ethic, you know, and, and, uh, and then, uh, Damien Kindler for Sanctuary too. He, he, um, worked his butt off. So those kind of showrunners, there are showrunners that I follow that, that, uh, that, um, uh, I find are, are, um, my heroes because they're, they, they, um, uh, elevate the business, you know, they elevate that, what they're doing, um, uh, in the, in the, in the, uh, the television world and things like this. And, and I love to follow those kind of things. And they encourage you to do good work, you know, oh, Not, I mean, what group of people can put out 40 shows per year, three years in a row? That's, oh, that's insane. I got to say, I, gotta say, I, I, um, I, I have a... Um, <laughs> that's either your stomach or it's a dog. It's a basset hound. Oh, uh, can you please Roy. show him? Sure, Roy, come here. Hey, Roy, come here. Come here. I'm sorry, but when I hear dog, it's it's all yeah. dog all the time. This is him. Ugh. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, I was groaning. Oh, uh, of course. So 40 shows a year, the people who can pull this off. You know, I, I mean, I, I, um, I, I've known Brad Wright for, oh, uh, three, 20, 23 years now. Um, you know, and, uh, um, and, uh, the stuff that, that we went through, um, in creating that show. And I, I, I have a, an interesting story about Brad. Uh, what we were uh, on an aircraft carrier. Uh, we were invited on an aircraft carrier. Is this the um, Carl Vinson? Oh uh, yeah, that we were on the Stargate Carl Universe. Vinson. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, when when I have a picture of Brad, I I, uh, I didn't know this was the moment, but I have a picture of Brad Wright. Uh, we were standing at the tail at the at the stern of the. Uh, um, uh, the aircraft carrier just watching this amazing sea and behind us and and uh, um, and uh, Brad came downstairs from uh, he'd been in the tower uh, he came down the stairs and had this look on his face and I took this picture of him and uh, he looked at me and he said universe is canceled it was the moment he found out that universe was canceled we were out on a we you're were at out sea on a, your phones don't work no, and uh, and uh, uh, John Lennox had uh, was with us, and he just found out um, from the uh, um, uh, from the control room that uh, that uh, this had happened. Somebody had seen it on Twitter or something like that, and they just told Brad. And uh, he looked at me, and said, "I can't, uh, I can't tell the, um, I can't tell the cast that we had with us." 
um, who are on board the aircraft carrier with you who are on board with us. Yeah. Cause we were having such an amazing time, all of us together. Yeah. And, uh, but he told me, and I, I had this picture of him and that picture is, is haunting because of the look on his face and you could see how that affected him, that, that loss of that show, you know, and, and, um, and it was, uh, uh, that's that's a picture that I always remember, and I was I would look at occasionally to to remind myself how um, people care about the, the things that they're doing, and the shows that they work on, and things like that. Because it's it, there's it's such a transient business, and people are in and people are out, and other people will pick up the reins for something. And, and uh, um, uh, that was one of those moments where I looked at Brad and I thought that that man just really just got very badly hurt. Yeah. Um, by the loss of that. I'm going to open the door so the dog can Sure. Like, Absolutely. <laughs> here, you, get out of here. Never darken my door again. <laughs> oh, they, all they want to do is is have you open the door for them so they can go in and out. Exactly. I exactly. remember getting the news that Universe was canceled. And I took it very personally. <laughs> and it took a long time for me to get over because I was so invested in the mythology that Brad had built with Jonathan and with Rob and with all of you over the years. But also, this was the first time that you guys had set a target in a specific show and said, this is where we're going. We don't know what the this is yet, but destiny had a destination mm -hmm. and it was ripped from us, you know, and it sucks to this day. You know, that which is why I am so behind Brad in wanting to develop the fourth show so that he can carry on in some form what uh, the missions of, of the three commands, Destiny, Atlantis, and SGC were before. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, how did you discover uh, this production or, or production, film and television production? You indicated your dad was some, was somehow yeah. involved. Um, my dad worked in, uh, he had a, a Canadian television show called This Land um, that he was producer and, uh, um, uh, and host of. And so uh, very early on, I went to, um, I hung around on set uh, with them. I, I uh, started shooting film very early um, and he just did not want me to, <laughs> didn't want me to be in television. Why not? It, it, because I think he realized how fickle it was. And, uh, and um, he enjoyed himself while he was in it, but I think that he was not, um, I wanted to be a cameraman. I, I started out shooting uh, news and, and things like this, and he just didn't want me, he didn't want me doing that. He wanted me to get a real job. And, uh, and then uh, when I started doing it, we actually, be, uh, uh, before he died, we got a chance to do a, a documentary together uh, where we traveled. Uh, together it was a it was a documentary about uh, Auschwitz believe it or not um, we traveled Ooh, with a um, with a survivor um, who wow. had been 16 when he was in the camp he lived for four years there as a Polish Catholic and uh, um, traveled with two uh, a Jewish young men and uh, and another Jewish survivor uh, went back uh, and uh, and shot this documentary and my dad uh, wrote it and and, and uh, produced it and hosted it and I shot it and we got a chance to work together. And that was something that was, that was amazing uh, to be together. I don't know how I would have done it without him there. And I don't know if he would have been able to do it without me there because we supported each other in such an amazing way, just because it is, it is the most horrible place on earth. It's just, uh, um, but it was, it was amazing to do that together. And I think that that's what made it for me. Um, so we got a chance to do that. Um, uh, uh, Having said that, um, the, the story of me coming to Stargate was interesting um, because I, uh, um, I had a friend who was producing the first season of it. Uh, Ron French was his name. And Ron and I had done a number of different things. I'd been his uh, um, second AD for a long time, um, then started firsting for him on a show called The Commish. Um, <laughs> of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with Chicky. Yeah. And... Uh, and uh, we, um, we, uh, he called and said, you know, I, I need a, I need a first AD on this thing to do the first, uh, the second block. Andy Makita was the first AD on, on the first block. And then I was the, uh, supposed to be the, the first AD on the second block. 
And I said, you know what, uh, Ron, I've, I've started directing just, I've done one, uh, one episode of a, um, a series called two. Um, uh, uh, and, and, uh, um, really wanted to pursue directing. He said, well, maybe, you know, we might have some second units or you know, something like that. So I went in and, uh, I, I, uh, first AD, the uh, first assistant directed the um, um, the second uh, show and the fourth show uh, of the series. And while I was doing the second show, um, Michael Greenberg and Richard Anderson said to me, um, hey, you know, we understand that you're directing some stuff. Can you direct some second units for us? And I said, sure. And for SG-1 the- or for MacGyver? Yeah. SG-1. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And uh, I said, sure. And started doing all these inserts for it. And then um, they put the, the first, uh, the, the pilot episode together that Mary has her party directed and, uh, and went, oh, we need some scenes reshot. We need this done. We need this, uh, we need this. Uh, we have to add this scene, we have to do this. So there were full scenes that were coming forward. And there was one with, with uh, Michael and Amanda in the uh, prison um, that they had to get out of. And uh, we were shooting, uh, uh, I had to shoot a, the, reshoot that scene, and there was a couple of other scenes that I had to reshoot, and uh, and so I did that and was able to get the uh, um, the stuff to them, and they ended up doing. It. They said, "Oh, you know what else we need? We need uh, we need somebody to go to uh, to um, uh, 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 na- uh, NORAD and shoot some establishers." And I went Colorado oh, Springs. I'll do it. Yeah, and. Uh, so went and that's a story in and of itself. Uh, the first time and the second time was a very much different trip for me um, to go and do that. But uh, um, went and shot all the establishers for it because uh, once we got you know uh, everything done, and it was it literally had to come back and go into the movie uh, right away because it was going on the air. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, um, uh, so went and shot all that stuff. They, uh, I was, I was finished this, the uh, fourth episode, um, so the two that I was supposed to do, and uh, um, I was saying goodbye. I was the day I was saying goodbye. I, uh, I was saying goodbye, and I remember uh, Mike Greenberg called me over to Rick's trailer, and he said, uh, he said, hey, hey, you're not going to leave without saying goodbye. I said, no, no, you guys were my last stop on this. So I walked over to the trailer, and I walked in, and um, and Rick goes, you're not going anywhere. I said, well, yeah, I got to go. My time's up. And Billy Mizell is coming into to, uh, first AD. He said, no, we're using you as our second unit director. We're hiring you as our second unit director. And uh, Brad and John Smith had gotten together and decided that they were going to have me in as, uh, as a second unit director with uh, Michael and, and Rick pushing them. So um, I started second unit directing. And then uh, sometime in the next uh, couple of episodes, they said, all right, we're going to give you an episode too. And that was Solitudes. Um, yes, it was. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, um, I pulled my tan- uh, the, the waistband and my pants tighter and, and decided, okay, this is, uh, this is what I have been talking about me wanting to do for so long. So yeah. let me get in there and do it. And, and <laughs> Brad was so funny because it was like, well, this is, this is where it's supposed to be. And I said, well, then we're going to freeze the, 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 um, uh, the studio. And John Smith goes, yes, we can do that. And Brad's like, what? <laughs> we can actually, I said, we need real ice. She's got a slide down. We need real right, ice. Right, she slides. And, uh, and it was very funny because it was one of those things where you sit there going, we're really, we're really going to do it. And I said, well, we need breath. We need cold breath. We need, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be real. And, uh, and then <laughs> I need to take Amanda up to Pemberton Glacier and shoot her there. The, well, the shot of her coming out of the, yeah. Of the snow. Yeah. And what's funny about that is that that uh, as we were helicoptering up there, that the, the second unit director of photography that was with me um, goes, you know, I, I got a sh- bad shoulder, and this has got to be handheld. I said, I'll shoot it. So I got out. I have this great picture of of, uh, of uh, Amanda and me on the glacier um, that Amanda sent me. I, I can't remember. It was a little while ago she sent it to me and, and reminded me that this was one of those things that, that you know, happens is that you, uh, these memories that, that, uh, that aren't there until the picture's there. And it's like, oh, yeah, I shot that shot of her coming out. And, you know, um, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. That was a, putting that first season together was a huge amount of fun. I got two episodes out of it. And that's kind of how I came into Stargate, how I came into directing Stargate. 
I want to talk more uh, specifically about that in the future. But right now, I, I have I have too much to, and the fans are 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 chomping at the bit to ask you some questions as well. Um, what is the pressure like to stay on time and on budget? I mean, you've got a line pr- producer on your shoulder saying uh, you're going to lose the crane shot in about uh, uh, five ten minutes there if we don't get this up. Oh, no, nope, crane's got to go home. Sorry, um, <laughs> jeez. Things like that. That pressure, that pressure for me has changed over oh. over 25 years. Um, the pressure now, I, I, um, I've had enough experience that I know, I know how to fit what I need into a day. Um, yeah, you can feel it. What I don't have is, is that, uh, that uh, camera going down or that sudden rainstorm or that I'm working on a series right now, uh, a Netflix series that we decided we were going to shoot eight days on Grouse Mountain in October, at the end of October. That's where Braytac and Tilk have their fight in uh, the flashback eight. and threshold. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, I just remember uh, Tony, Tony Amadillo saying, Grouse. I'll never forget yeah. him saying, Grouse. Please go ahead. I'm sorry. So um, we decided we were going to shoot up there in October. Now, the eight days worth of shooting actually is 12 days because you have two weekends in there. And I said, you guys realize that this, this essentially in the script, about four hours passes in the time I had to shoot that eight days worth of stuff. And I said that you realize that over that four hours, we're going to have every different type of weather. And we're on a mountain. So we're the clouds that you get above when you go up the, the gondola that you're looking at and going, oh, it's so beautiful down there. I'm dreading it because I know that there as a, day gets warmer those clouds come up over top of us and we're just sitting in fog and in clouds right and you watch it come in you're just literally sitting there watching your shot disappear in front of you as this cloud moves through um and so the reason i'm saying that is an answer to what you're talking about right now is that it's those things that take up uh my brain power these days it's 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 uh watching the sun drop when you're on a mountain into a little notch that uh, that you've sort of timed it out so the sun is going to be right there on my last shot. And if not, then I don't have this last shot. Um, and it's things like that that I watch. When I started directing, I didn't know how much stuff to put in. So I put in too much stuff. And there was always, you're, you spend way too much time shooting um, in the morning, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, there's a number of different movie adages that say, you know, um, you shoot Gone with the Wind in the morning and, Starsky and Hutch in the afternoon are desperately old references, but <laughs> but the fact is that that you you shoot like you're doing a feature in the morning, and then in the afternoon you scramble to try and watch the sun go down. Um, with the cameras we have these days, uh, you know they, they have such amazing um, uh, light gathering capability that when you look and you with your naked eye you're going this is too dark to shoot, and you look at the monitor you're going that's crazy because it's bright it's like daytime. Um, uh, as long as nobody sort of has a light in the picture, which blooms all over. <laughs> but um, it is uh, it is kind of crazy what they'll do these days. So when I started, it was um, putting too much stuff in the bag. Uh, now it's, I know how much stuff I can fit into the bag for the most part. It's the things like the cloud coming in, the, uh, the camera giving up the ghost or um, or uh, an actor not showing up on time. You know, when those, those things that you don't have control over, those are the things I, uh, I wrestle with right now. And for the most part, can, and can speak to the, uh, uh, the line producer on my shoulder and, and, and uh, horse trade with them too. Uh, so it's like, I know, I know I've got a crane for this much time, but uh, I need, and these days it's a drone, but- uh, That's true. Um, you know, I need, uh, I, I, I'll give you this if I can have that. Or let me take some meal penalty here. Um, I'll get, get us out of here an hour early tonight if I take that meal penalty. If not, I'm going to be pushing against the sun. And it's, it's that kind of thing that I know enough about now. Um, you know, after putting in the 10,000 hours that, uh, that you have to put in. Uh, I, I know enough now. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with the days these days. Um, uh, there are still scripts that I get that, <laughs> you, you do one of those on um uh and especially now especially now when when i i look at a crowd scene and i go 
there's a different way I have to shoot a crowd scene. I can still shoot crowd scenes, but I can't shoot them the same way. And I spent two and a half hours the other day uh, making a crowd um, because I couldn't have one. Um, you know, I had 60 background that were all, um, every four of them has a, uh, has a COVID person with them who also counts as a, as a background person. But so they're separated, they're, they're family groups you put together rather than, than right. uh, you know. You'd be strategic about it, yeah. Yeah, you have to put them together. Go into longer lenses um, so that you can compress everybody into it. So I have my actors walking through a crowd, but they're actually not. There's a corridor for them to walk through. But because I'm shooting through people on a long lens, it looks like they're in amongst this crowd all the time. So it's things like that. The, the COVID of it all is, is one of those things that, that is, it's taking a little bit more time these days. Um, uh, I'm used to it now. I've been shooting for uh, um, since June um, and I have, have enough, uh, um, uh, enough of it behind me to know, you know, you, you're wearing a mask, you're wearing a face shield, um, you're being tested all the time. Uh, you're wearing a watch that buzzes when you're too close to somebody for too long. Um, that tracks wow. you. We're wearing, we're wearing wristbands that show how close we can get to the actors and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's 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 a different world right now. Well, I mean, you've got to make it work. But this industry, like so many others out there, will die if if you don't have, you know something in the process of moving and you know th but at the same time you have to have precautions so it sounds well, like you guys are doing it you're dealing with people who have to take their masks off yeah um, you know the crew is masked all day long in in kn95s which are not the, the uh, n95s but they're the next best thing so we treat everybody like they're asymptomatic um so if something does happen on set you can contact trace and for the most part people because they've been wearing a face shield and a, and a, and a mask all day long, but the actors are the ones that have to take their masks off, you know, right. and have to act in amongst other people like that. And and that's where the danger is for us. Yeah. Uh, we were talking to Garwin Sanford uh, during the GateCon reunion, and he was like, I'm out until this thing is settled down. You know, there's a lot of actors who just, they, they like, they're not willing to uh, put their families at risk, you know, and then there are others who are like, you know, my kids are grown. I'm not in that position anymore, or for whatever reason, I can do it. So Joe Flanagan's doing C right now, or he just finished, I think. So, yeah, it's a crazy time. Um, really the uh, man, I have so much I want to talk about with you. You know, what? I'm going to skip over some of my own stuff, and I'm going to I'm going to let the fans uh, ask for a little bit here. Um, Jeremy he uh, Heiner, if you don't mind me going straight to fans for a little bit. Uh, he says, I love crossover episodes with the Pegasus Project being one of my favorite episodes of Stargate. If you could have directed a crossover episode with the cast from all three shows, uh, what would you have liked to have seen it be about? What do you think they were good at um, as a fan of the material yourself? Right. What do I think they were good at? If you um, could have directed a crossover episode for the cast of all three, what would you have liked to have seen? Um, that's tough because I was, I, I was, I watched all the episodes. I, uh, uh, Martin, I'm losing um, you. Am I back yet? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I have a son who's on Minecraft right now. So <laughs> uh, At least he has taste. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, um, I mean, I, I think the, the meeting of, of uh, David Hewlett and, uh, and David Blue would be a really interesting sort of uh, matchup. Um, uh, I think that, uh, um, I mean, Louis was all, I, I've done a number of different projects with Louis and- uh, Ferreira, yeah. yeah. Colonel Young. And uh, um, I, I'd like to see what he and Joe Flanagan do together. Um, we established they know each other in universe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, what was always interesting was Amanda was always the person that could could float from one to the next. And when, when we brought her over to Atlantis, it was like it really wasn't like there was a big transition um, in there, you know, uh, uh, as, as she moved into that position. But I would like to see sort of what happens to the command structure on um, 
uh, you know, in the universe on the destiny. Um, you know, when, when, uh, if, if, uh, Carter had been there, mm-hmm. um, because I think that that's, uh, that, 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 that dynamic in there would have changed a lot. And, uh, especially for Robert, I think that, uh, that, uh, that Bobby would have, uh, his character would have, uh, there would have been a different dynamic to his character if Carter had been involved in, in some of the decision-making that was, uh, was happening on, uh, on the ship. Well, with her years of experience, that makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Claire, yeah. Claire Callan wants you to talk to us about filming in the Arctic. Ah. So it's, it's interesting. You started uh, directing in the Antarctic. And yeah. I, I made this comment to you a couple of years ago. And then finished in the Arctic. Yes. There's a certain symmetry to that. Um, uh, forever grateful to Barry Campbell for, for uh, um, who a lot of, uh, who everybody's met these days. And, oh, and, uh, wonderful guy. Barry has, has, has you know, that, that day that he walked up to us uh, while we were signing autographs and said, hey, you guys want to go up to the uh, uh, the Arctic and uh, watch the submarine come through the ice? And our immediate response was, yes. <laughs> and Brad's like, I can, write a, I can write a scene about that. I can write some scenes about that. Yeah, sure. We'll, you know, that to me um, is it was one of those indelible moments of, of Stargate for me was was that uh, that understanding. Um, you know, of, of the fact that we could actually get up to, uh, you know, the North Pole and shoot in the Arctic. And, and truthfully, I mean, I've, I've told the stories at different uh, conventions and things like that about, about what happens. And, and uh, um, the, 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 the fact that we were sitting on this little tiny spot of ice, uh, you know, uh, six feet of ice and 12,000 feet of water beneath us. And, and everybody literally all the time was looking at each other going, I can't believe we're here, you know, <laughs> in the middle of shooting. And that the day that, that, uh, that Evil Kenny uh, and I, uh, our props guy, uh, got onto uh, a snowmobile and said, we'll be back because it was, you know, minus 58 and the wind was blowing to a point where we couldn't shoot. And we went, we'll be back, <laughs> got on the snowmobile and rode away from the, uh, um, from the, ice, uh, the ice camp where we were to try and find a place we could shoot that was surrounded by um, banked ice enough that would cut the wind, um, uh, you know, and, uh, and we were able to do that. We actually were able to, to find a place that we could actually shoot uh, that, was, that was, uh, had enough protection from the wind. And we went back and everybody was just watching the thermometer get higher and higher until it got to the point where we could say, okay, nothing's going to have break immediately when we step out. So let's do that. Um, uh, uh, I had to step outside once in my shorts uh, to get a picture taken. <laughs> of course you did. Uh, so yeah. Mine was 28. And I think a lot of people may have seen that, uh, that picture, but uh, um, I have a picture where I, I stepped outside and I ran over to uh, um, the girl's, uh, a hooch that was over there, the, 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 the place where they were living, knocked on the door. Amanda opens it, goes, you're an idiot, and closes the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it was, uh, um, yeah, because I needed that picture for people like Claire who just keep talking about my shorts. And uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, How many a, days were you up there? Seven days, I think. I think it was seven. Man. And you um, shot five of those days, I'm guessing? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, it was it was quite something. I know that uh, that Rick arrived later. Uh, he arrived two days after we got there, and um, uh, so it was Ben and Amanda and uh, and the majority of the crew. So you Brad could get their was, walking shots in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the helicopter flyover, which was a brilliant shot that you know Peter West and our and our our, uh, um, our uh, um, key grip came up with. It was the ability to be able to shoot from a helicopter when we are tracking them across the, the, uh, the landscape, um, there and, and, um, uh, the sunset and the sunrise that we shot and things like that. There was just some, some amazing stuff that happened in there. And then coming back from that and having to recreate it for Michael. Exactly. Um, yeah. On know, the stage uh, was, was something too, which, uh, has always held up for me. I, I was worried about it. Uh, you know, and, uh, I remember, and I don't know if you've heard this before, but, um, the director's cut was finished and Brad comes in to sit with me and we're watching it. And, uh, and the, uh, the uh, uh, submarine comes up through the ice. It, it, it took us three tries to get that submarine to do what it did. And 
I, um, I don't know if I have I told you the story about what happened over the tell it three. again. So the 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 first day we were um, we were supposed to um, uh, have this uh, coming up through the ice and all we decided to do was shoot it coming up through the ice because I hadn't seen it yet. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I didn't I sort of didn't have the setup yet where where, um, uh, you know, Carter asks him, what are we waiting for? And he goes that, um, you know, and points to it and then it comes up through the ice. Um, you know, uh, I didn't have in my head how I wanted it to look. So I just thought, okay, there'll be a POV. It'll be looking past them to it. And, uh, um, you know, and then uh, he can order Major Wood to do whatever he wants to do. And um, so um, um, I had I had to be there because I was, there was only Evil Kenny and I to, to uh, be the background extras for it. So it was, uh, it was one of those things where um, we, we were the only people up there that, that could uh, you know, could fit into the white coats. And you have an established character, you know, exactly. it's a background character nonetheless, but nonetheless, we gave him some dialogue. Exactly. So, um, uh, uh, the first day it was supposed to come up and, um, the way that you, you get it to come up is, is you're in an area, um, of, of, uh, water that has, uh, uh, literally, uh, broke apart overnight, uh, collapsed into the, uh, um, uh, uh, deep down into the ocean, setting these, these white frozen sails down into the, uh, the ocean. And then it freezes up overnight. So where the, the ice on the sides is between four and six feet deep, the, the ice that has refrozen is about two feet deep. Um, and so you, you mark it with a, uh, you, you take a snow shovel and just mark this long arrow. Uh, you put a hash mark in it and then you put a circle in it and an X. And they're uh, coming along in a, in a submarine, looking up with the periscope, spot it, um, give you the signal, come up and uh, break through. Um, now, in the history of doing this, I guess they had never sort of hit the X before. So we were all prepared. We were all told, you know, it is, <laughs> the one comment that always gets me is, is so they can't see us. Uh, so if you feel something move underneath your feet, run. Um, <laughs> It's like, where, where do we run? Yeah. You know, and it's back that way. Cause the ice is thicker. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, the first day we're all looking here and then somebody hears something way over there and about 200 meters away, we see this, uh, submarine come up and it's like, Oh, they used the marking from yesterday. It's oh, like, no. Oh no, the X was oh. still over there. Yeah, <laughs> so I couldn't use the shot because nobody was pointing. That's way too far. Yeah. Um, uh, so then uh, we try the next day and it's not working, and then finally we have this one shot at it, and uh, and I thought, you know what? I'm just now that I've seen what it looks like, we're gonna put Rick here, Ben and uh, Amanda here, and I'm gonna look between them. And Peter West, the director of photography, looks at me and goes, "Are you nuts?" It's not going to be that accurate. And I said, you can find it. You can just stand there. You're on your feet. You're, you know, you've got the camera. Find it. As soon as you see it, we'll point it out to you. And, and so, but put the X right between you. And so uh, we do that. And, and um, we, there's a hydrophone in the water uh, to hear um, because we're pinging them. Uh, but there's also, there's, uh, there's other actors underwater that, uh, that we're not supposed to, you know, give any information to. So, they can't talk to us through the hydrophone except for one word and their word to come up was football. So we hear football and we know they're coming up. And so everybody's poised and ready. And, um, you know, we're sitting there and I'm looking everywhere, but at the X, cause I'm thinking he's going to come up somewhere. He's going to come. I had, uh, um, Andy, my second camera is just sort of sitting there scanning ready for it to wherever it came up. Cause I couldn't miss it this time. Um, and, uh, and, it comes up. The shot you see is the shot it came up in. Peter didn't have to move at all. It was like this thing just came right up through. And you, you hear the uh, um, uh, uh, the XO on the, on the uh, um, submarine go, that one's for Hollywood. And <laughs> <laughs> it breaks up through the ice and it's just this, this glorious thing. And, and nobody can cheer because they're all on camera, right? Um, but uh, as soon as it was finished, I say cut. And everybody's cheering and cheering because we've been waiting for three days for this. So I'm sitting in the edit suite with Brad watching this. And he looks at me and he goes, they're all going to think it's a vis effect.
I mean, it's true. It's true. Why did we go up to the Arctic? They get that because it would have been a visit back. <laughs> anyway. I've always wondered. Uh, the, the the sequence up there is just extraordinary. And from my perspective, it looks like you got everything that you wanted. Was there any shots that you wanted that you didn't get, that you couldn't get, or um, that you ran out of time? Any shots I didn't get? Uh, I don't think so. No, I, I didn't run out of town. I know that Rick wasn't feeling well. Oh, um, oh no. Because three days later, he... Uh, went and had surgery. He didn't know he needed it, but uh, but he wasn't feeling a hundred percent. And I know that there was a couple of things that we wanted to do um, uh, that I wanted to spend a little more time on. But but quite honestly, it's it's uh, that's as much as we, we filled the day with that uh, with uh, with what we got. We filled the days with it, even though it's such a little tiny amount of time. Um, uh, it would have been more fun on the the uh, submarine itself to do a little bit more shooting. Um, uh, we were invited on and the, the scene in the, uh, um, in the officer's mess that we do, uh, uh, where we meet up with, with, uh, um, Daniel, mm. um, that was actually shot on stage. Um, and, and rightly so because, uh, uh, a Los Angeles class submarine is no place for a film crew to be working around. It's just so it is very tight. If we were on one of the, the, uh, the boomers, I think we'd have a little bit more room. But uh, we needed to build that inside the uh, the, the stuff in the uh, in the con is actually uh, on the uh, on the um, uh, um, uh, on board the uh, the submarine itself, and uh, um, that's the actual submarine commander that has the line that yes, it wanted, is. Um, you know that that sort of paid for the trip. <laughs> that uh, that <laughs> line about uh, no problem. The, uh, Always they, a pleasure to help the Air Force. To save the Air Force's ass, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that was uh, um, that was wonderful. And there's another. There's one more story I'll tell you very quickly about that. There, uh, as the um, as the uh, uh, submarine comes up through the ice, and then there's uh, there's a a bit of dialogue on on the uh, the uh, actor side. And I turn around, and you see the uh, um, periscope and the antenna come up uh, through there, and uh, uh, so I'm on uh, on the radio, um, and I have the XO beside me, and the the, uh, um, uh, the sub commander is is on uh, thing, and so I say and uh, uh, raise the periscope, and uh, the XO looks at me, this look in his face, he goes, nobody's ever said that, except the commander, and I went, okay, well he gets to say cut a couple times for me, and, and so there's a scene where where um where rick walks away um uh from i said i i walked up to him and i said uh so you can you can actually say action cut in this one if you'd like to me he's excited about doing that and i said but you have to you don't ever just say cut to rick you have to tell him you know what you thought of the performance and he goes really to richard dean anderson i said yeah you have to which is not true <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, he's gonna get the full meal deal here um and uh, and Rick has to come walking down this this hallway, and uh, and so we we shoot it and he says action and Rick finishes and and uh, Commander says cut Anderson come on be more believable and Rick goes what what <laughs> he says he says that was crap let's do it again and I'm like nice <laughs> <laughs> wow. What an opportunity, though. And that wasn't the first time you'd shot on a submarine. You did no. Small Victories. Small Victories, which is one of my favorite all-time uh, shows. That that and Matter of Time were two of my very favorite shows, um, you know, certainly from early SG-1. Um, Small Victories was, was uh, for me, it was such a technological kind of change for me to be able to have all those screens going and all those things going. And uh, we got on uh, the uh, Russian Foxtrot uh, submarine and, and and on the Raven and um, uh, I knew I wanted a shot from uh, the the um, uh, replicator's position at the back, you know, uh, of the, this thing as the, as the the torpedo tube gets opened up, and uh, so I oh the at, opening of the episode yeah yeah, yeah. 
with the, with the two Russian sailors, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I love the fact that Brad actually has them say what they say in there. The, the translation is. Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, what do you think it is? I think it's the creatures from the last episode. <laughs> I think it sounds like some of the creatures from the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those things that in a writer's room everybody just laughs about and then brad goes yeah let's do that <laughs> okay why not um, yeah. so i look at will Waring, who is the uh uh will was the the a camera operator on the, the show and i said uh, so the next one is is get in and pull the camera with you uh so you just have to put your feet against the seawall at the back the, the the uh torpedo door at the back but you have to crawl in and he goes no wow and i said really and he goes, I'm not going in a torpedo tube. No way. This isn't a retired sub, right? This is the re this is the retired sub. Oh, it is, is retired. The, okay. The Russian one, yeah. Okay. And I went, uh, uh, okay. And I look at Andy, the, the B cam rubber, and he goes, and I went, okay. And Jim Menard, who is the DP, looks at me and he goes, looks like you're going in. <laughs> so I thought, ah, that's nothing. So I go in. Now, I'm, I'm six feet tall and I have fairly broad shoulders. I had to squeeze in like this and didn't realize that the entire interior of this thing is covered in rust, rust flakes and this kind of stuff. Oh, and so wow. I have to go like this and I'm pulling a camera with me until my feet hit the seawall, uh, the, 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 the uh, torpedo door on the outside of the submarine. This is a submerged submarine, remember? It's, it's it, this part of this. You're submarine. underwater. Yeah. And I can only see like little slivers of light on either side of the, uh, the camera as the door is open. I said, okay, so Jim, um, to, to Menard, uh, essentially, let's just let's get ready to roll because I have no communication. I have no walkie communication. I have nothing because it's, it's a steel tube, steel coffin is what it is. And uh, I'm starting to feel a little bit. I'm thinking that's weird that my feet are against this, the, the water, you know, and, uh, and I'm in this. And then they close the door. And I've... I've caved i've spelunked uh, enough to know what real darkness looks like but i've never been in this position and complete darkness you're entombed and, yeah and all I, and no sound either nothing and i'm yelling action 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 and nobody's doing anything and i'm like oh man they can't hear anything no they don't know i'm saying action so finally out there one of them says He's probably saying action and we just can't hear it. And so the guy opens the door, we get the shot and I go, got it, let's go. And get him get me out of here. Out. And Jim says, are you claustrophobic? He said, I didn't think so until now. But um, that's how that shot came about was with me with my feet against the, the wall. I would have thought you would have put a, you know, the thing on wheels and taken a pole and, you know, pushed it in the back and shot it and come back out. Sense, wouldn't it? Would have made more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to ask you earlier, the, the, you, you're talking about, you know, we don't usually use cranes anymore. We use drones, uh, little things like that. Crowd sequences. A lot of times you can, you can add people digitally later. Uh, what has it been like watching the technology evolve? Cause I'm, I'm always interested in the, the technical front of things in whatever industry there is as we move forward in time, just watching things get smaller and smaller and lighter and in many cases cheaper. All right. Is it more complicated to film today, no. pre-COVID, than it was when you started? No. In fact, it was a conversation I was having with a DP I'm working with right now is that, that for probably about 20 years, there was very little innovation, innovation. You know, there's the steady cam. There was a techno crane, you know, the crane that moves uh, on their head in and out. There wasn't a lot of, of um, huge innovation that happened. And nowadays, the cameras are so tiny. There's this new red Komodo that, that, that's come out, you know, that, and they're so sensitive to light. And there's there's gimbals and there's, there's um, you know, uh, uh, the drones that we're using. And I just finished using a racing drone the other day, this FPV racing drone. It was, um, I was doing a tree treetop course in the show that I'm doing right now where these people are doing this ropes course. And literally this thing is flying... At the, at the two actors who are on a, a net, on a, on a rope net, and it flies through one of the loops of the, the rope net while they're on it, and then comes out the other side, which it, it looks like a vis effect shot. Um, there were, there were uh, these mountain bikes coming down a mountain, and this drone is flying around them as they're going down like that. 
it's ridiculous what these things can do nowadays. And that kind of innovation is happening so fast. Um, you know, um, uh, this thing has changed everything, you know, just, just the fact that, uh, you can make a movie on, on an iPhone these days, you know, and it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. You know, there's, there's, there's not necessarily the dynamic range and things like, and you wouldn't want to produce like a feature screen necessarily, but it, capability is can you can, you know, you're you're, you're editing on on uh, iPads, your your uh, and laptops. Uh, that change has happened so much, and it has made it more accessible. Um, whereas there was there was this um, you know sort of um, cadre of people that could could do film before, that could make film before. Um, because the, it was so expensive to use the equipment and, and or rent the equipment and stuff. Nowadays, uh, young filmmakers are able to do it on their own. Um, I, I don't think it means you, you get around the rules, but uh, um, the rules still need to be there. Uh, but yeah. it has changed so much. You know, we were we're in talks for a, a sanctuary reboot right now. And, I did uh, not know this. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's, there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a script being written right now. Uh, That's fantastic. We, you know, to, to try and pitch a, a reboot for a sanctuary. But on the call we had yesterday, uh, we were talking about technology and what you get to do with it. And, and um, the advent of light walls, you know, and the Mandalorian's volume and things like this. The volume is insane. It is. And I just, I finished, uh, I used a, I used a, um, a 30 foot light wall the other day. Um, you know, with an Unreal Engine on it, and and it's crazy. So for Sanctuary, for sure, it's going to change the way we make uh, we make uh, you know a show like Sanctuary. Anything that we we would do that we used to, you know, we were pushing things like rear screen projection. We were pushing things like you know, what do we see out these windows? Now that you can use a, a light wall and actually have the, the the light streaming in on you from this light wall. Yeah, there's no longer any green bleed or anything like that. It's real. Driving cars. I mean, driving cars where, where you used to have to reproduce the trees and the leaves and this kind of stuff. Now those things are actually happening on the screen and it actually it changes on your face enough. And you can wear sunglasses and you can do this kind of stuff and you're looking at the thing that you're supposed to be looking at. And the actors, I'm sure, have to appreciate it just as much. You know? Well, they're actually able to see what they're supposed they're to They're seeing what they're supposed to. Yeah. I yeah. cannot wait and I've been waiting and waiting, and it keeps on getting pushed back. It, for an inno- from an innovation perspective alone, for Top Gun, yeah, the stuff that they did in that, or it looks like that they did, I can't wait. So uh, when I went to Guam, I needed uh, another camera. We were using a thing called a Sony Venice camera um, there, which is a, a great camera. I needed one more, and I was told no because, and we were getting a bunch of our camera gear out of Hawaii, said, no, because Top Gun has all of them. <laughs> no, what do you mean all of them? They said, they have all of them. They're shooting with like 40 cameras. And I'm like, okay. It's Tom Cruise <laughs> for you. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. You mentioned, I, I, I didn't realize that you originally went to NORAD. I thought that you had gone the second time for the second round of footage that we got a few years later. Can you tell that, that first story? Yes. Because it's shots are in every episode. So um, uh, they asked me to go, and um, I had someone from MGM there with me uh, that uh, um, we sort of decided we're going to go, and I'm going to shoot for 24 hours straight. Um, I'm going to shoot day, night, day. So I had sun down, sun up, I had night, I had all that kind of stuff. And we put together a film crew. Uh, I'd never met any of them before. Um, and went to NORAD and, uh, and said, okay, here's what we need to do. And uh, I said, I need this number of people before I get there so I can use his background extras. And like, are you serious? Really, we're gonna take the time out to do this? Now, what's funny to me is that it was the beginning of my relationship with the, the, uh, the Air Force. And, um, and uh, at the time, a Canadian general was in charge of NORAD. Oh. And, uh, and so I, I was able to sort of, uh, with MGM, we were able to sort of pull a few strings that normally wouldn't have been able to be pulled and got access to a number of different things, like the doors closing and that. Yeah, kind of the stuff. soldiers running in. Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, and needed to do a bunch of stuff while we were there. Um, and I think I had 25 background people. So over the, the course of, you know, eight years, it's the same 20 people doing all this kind of stuff, you know, and, and, uh, were the military and, personnel real or were they all actors? Oh yeah. No. Cause they, I wouldn't have been able to get not, uh, non real people that close to the base, you know, and get them in. Wow. That's this cool. is what I love about the fact that, 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 you know, when I was in Guam, I said, I want all the background to be real. And they're like, sure. And I needed some actors from it too. And I said, so we did do a casting call and then mm -hmm. the air force office in Los Angeles, um, uh, uh, Colonel Brochier and, and, uh, and Captain Scherner, uh, who are our people in Guam said, yes, we can do this. They didn't, they didn't hesitate. They, didn't, they really just wanted to do what we were asking them to do. And then they went out and did, you know, polled people and said, would you like to be in a movie? Sure. Yeah. Have you got any acting experience? Sure. Yeah. They, we did a casting with them. Same thing when we went to NORAD the first time was we sort of called the, the uh, production office, which is in its infancy at that point, you know, um, saying, um, this is what we're going to need. And they said, okay, we can probably swing that. We can probably get that. So we went and I shot for 24 hours and um, uh, we were exhausted at the end of it. We got the film back and like two weeks later, the, the pilot was on the air. Um, wow. And then at, at, in around year seven or eight, we thought, boy, we're getting really tired of seeing the same establishing shots. How about we go back and shoot another one another day? And I said, I'll do it. Yeah, you can. You've got the clearances. Now you do this kind of stuff. You know so, what you'd like to see different now. Yeah, yeah. And the fact is I knew how to get into things and what I could see in things. You shot there. So, yeah. So um, I, uh, I landed and... <laughs> I, I, I get off the plane and there's a car waiting there for me. And, uh, and the, the, the a woman that was driving me was so exuberant. How about it? She goes, Oh my God, we're so happy to have you here. The first time around, nobody knew who we were because nobody had ever seen the show. Nobody did anything like that. And I remember that the, the, um, uh, uh, the head of their security uh, came up to me and said, you know, yeah, I, I, I answer all these questions about, about, you know, um, about nukes in the middle of the mountain and stuff. That's all the time. Now you're doing a show about something that's 28 floors yeah. beneath. There's no missile silo there. And, no. and he goes, uh, he goes, Oh, great. So anyway, the second time I come in, this woman is so happy. It, it, uh, this, uh, uh, corporal that was, that was driving. Me. We get there and, um, uh, no, it was, a, it was a captain that was driving me. It was, a, it was an officer that was driving me. So the, this captain gets out and she says, I'd like to introduce you to some people. And she opens the door and we go into this, this room and there's 200 people sitting there. And they cheer. And I'm like, hi. And I went, how are you? And they said, we want to be in the movies. And I was like, so I had 200 people now that wanted to be background people on the, the new establishing shots and says, and they said they won the lottery to be able to do it. You know, so it's, it's like, wow, we want to do this. And we're taking two days off and we're going to help you. And it's like, okay, terrific. So there's so many people who were fans of the show that came up and talked to me about it too. Um, uh, we're starting to shoot and uh, I'm, I'm getting some stuff. And this, this uh, car drives up and one of the, the security hummers drives up and, and out steps this man, brush cut, <laughs> flat top. Um, and everybody's, oh, no. And I went, what do you, oh, no, what is oh, no? And they said, uh, he looks like he's coming for you. And it was the, the head of security now comes walking over to me and goes, son, come with me. I said, okay, we're just, uh, he goes, I know what you're doing. I know the second you stepped off the plane. And I'm like, oh, man. Okay. So I get in with him and we're driving into uh, the base. Now the base, it's 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 more than a kilometer long, uh, the drive, and uh, I'm trying to talk to him, and he's not talking to me. I said, "Have you seen the show?" And he's like, "Straight ahead, not talking to me." And I said something. And he at one point he went, and I went, "Okay, I guess we're not talking." And um, so we we get there, and he goes, "Come with me," and we start up into the control area, which when I I'd first walked through it. A lot of the doors had been shuttered and space command I wasn't allowed to look into and things this. 
And now the doors are more open and I can sort of look in. And so I'm, I'm rubbernecking as we're going. He goes, he goes, eyes ahead. And I went, oh man, I am going to the principal's office in a big way here. And I'm thinking, what did I do that, that got this? We walk down this corridor and we stop. And he goes, look. And I look to the right and there's this door, this white door with a window in it. And it says, Stargate Command. And there's an arrow down like this. And I went, what? He goes, it's a broom closet. I finally had to make it so that there's some place here that people, because they all ask, where's Stargate Command? How'd they get down to it? He goes, I got you, didn't I? He's laughing. He's a huge fan of the show. I got you. You should have seen. I expected a wet spot on that on that uh, passenger seat when you got out of that seat. And I went, oh, man. He goes, he goes I'm a huge fan. Can I be in it? And I went, sure. <laughs> Oh, so wow. I actually have a door there that says Stargate Command. And it's a broom uh, closet. It's a broom closet. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, I've wanted to go for so many years. It's still on my bucket list. Yeah. My only issue, Martin, the next time you do it, go and get some shots in winter. It's snow half the year there. <laughs> Wonderful story. Thank you. Was there, uh, Iris O'Dair, was there any difference between working with Amanda Tapping on Stargate and working with her on Sanctuary? Um, there was a big difference between Magnus and Carter. That's true. There was true. no difference between uh, Amanda. Um, Amanda and I have known each other since that first day in 1997 when I stepped onto the set. It was a boardroom scene. Um, uh, we were sitting together on the uh, on the, the uh, um, on the table um, in the boardroom, and we were talking about something, and uh, and uh, realized that uh, that we had certain things in common. So this, and we talked, and and uh, and um, and um, eventually, like uh, her house is a couple of blocks from mine. You know, <laughs> a couple of blocks the other way. Aww. Andy McKees is there. Uh, our kids are best friends, you know. Uh, oh, good. Um, her daughter and, and uh, my daughter and son, uh, she's between the two of them, and they've been friends forever and ever. Um, uh, Michael Shanks and Lexa Doy, her two kids are best friends with my two kids. And we're, we're all together. We've been friends forever and ever. And so by the time we were doing Sanctuary, Amanda and I were, were, were you know, our best friends. And so it was, I didn't notice a big difference um, in Amanda um, in the way that, that, Magnus was Magnus was a a hundred percent different character than than uh, than Carter um, for Amanda and uh, and when we decided to change her hair color and all that kind of stuff and, and and you know make Magnus that different character when we were doing the uh, when we were doing the webisodes um, <clears throat> uh, you know uh, Amanda was very open about the fact that she said I I don't want it to be mixed up with Carter I don't want uh, Magnus to be different that's or, fair uh, mixed up with Carter because. It is a different show, and yeah. the way Damien was writing it was was, you know, uh, she's a different character completely. Um, they're both unbelievably strong female um, uh, characters, and uh, Amanda does that really, really well. But uh, I think she she made uh, a conscious decision to not have the two women um, uh, share too many um, uh, uh, um, character traits. And so in dealing with Magnus and talking to uh, Amanda about Magnus and things like that, it was a totally different conversation than, than I would have with Carter uh, and Amanda about Carter. Um, but again, because we sort of were there at the, the beginning of both of those characters, I, I watched them both grow up, mm. you know, and, and Amanda was so remarkable with the way that she, um, she dove into those characters and, 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 and imbued them with life that uh, that all I did was follow her lead and, and uh, deal with them, you know, the way that she built them. And she has followed you into the director's chair. You must be so proud. Oh, well, she is. Uh, She's she excellent. Is way beyond me in terms of what she's dealing with these days. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, she's got... Uh, She's got much, I, I've, I've been sort of uh, lately been doing a lot more uh, romantic comedies and uh, romantic dramas and, and, uh, and uh, much more character-based stuff. And she's dealing with massive shows with big, huge effects and for that. So she's, she's taken off with that. And is, is uh, she in, in this town, she is the, she's the uh, director to get if you're going to do that kind of work. 
I'm really glad to hear that. X, yeah. XF Chemist 1, there was such a chemistry between RDA and Amanda. How was it directing them together? What's funny is it it was it was to my recollection, I'm not sure uh, how much of this is real and how much of it I've sort of in my head recreated and made up, but uh, Rick and Amanda and I were playing with it more than anything else. We were fooling around with it. It wasn't originally part of who they were. They weren't originally, you know, that wasn't the characters. They weren't, there was no crossover with that, uh, um, you know, uh, romantically with that. And I remember um, uh, the scene where, it wasn't Nirti, it was, near to we were we were uh they woke up on the beds in in is this uh uh out of mind end of season two i think it's out of mind yeah where they're lying on the beds and and uh, yes yeah okay they're frozen is it near to was it was it no it was uh, hathor uh, uh, hathor right um, get your gold straight buddy <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. um uh so uh you're right it's it's uh um, uh, they're on the beds and um, Amanda got up and Rick did this thing that Rick does not 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 O'Neill does and he's looking at her naked back and I said oh we got to use that he goes I'm not doing that on camera and I said yeah we got to do it we got to do it we got to do it it's so much fun and he goes seriously and I said yeah and he goes he goes well let's do one without we'll, we'll do one with yeah one for safety without. yeah and I said sure and, and we did it and then as we were in the hallway and they're escaping, he has this other one where, where I put them really close together. And he goes, he goes, she's like right up my back. And I said, yeah, yeah. Just, just cause it's, we're behind a column. You have to be right. And he turns around and they're too close. And, uh, and I said, keep it, let's try it. And he, he goes, you're really pushing this, aren't you? I said, it's fun. Come on. Let's There's a sexual tension between these two characters, just as yeah. there are with people in real life. Yeah. You know, and it was more that we were playing around with it. Two, the three of us were just playing around with something there. And I think that, uh, that uh, uh, Coop and Brad sort of saw that and, and, and um, the other writers sort of saw that starting to play out and were enjoying it. And so started to fill it in a little bit. And it was, uh, um, uh, uh, and then, then they were both conscious of, of uh, I mean, Rick was all for it, but I think Amanda was a little bit more conscious of the, the actual rules and, and what she had to do. But like military we, rules. Yeah. You know, as we progressed over the years, it was, it started to get uh, easier and easier for that. Um, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't an immediate thing. It wasn't, it wasn't sort of season one kind of thing. It was mm. that the, the chain of command was there and very obvious and uh, and it wasn't the characters so much um uh but i think that, that and that's again to my recollection it was it was more that we started playing around with it and uh, and it started to be something that was was actually that everybody was noticing and and uh was having fun with well you had the ship episodes for sure if there were any relationshiping episodes you got solitudes oh, yeah. you've got divide and conquer i mean that's the big one where he admits that he has feelings you yeah. know, it drives the plot. The saran wrap uh, force field. Right, exactly. And that was used for years and years throughout the show. Yeah. There's a picture I have of a behind the scenes shot of Jason Momoa with saran wrap across his face. And yeah. whatever it takes to get those shots, man. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to be innovative if you yeah. want something to be uh, achieved in camera practically. It's true. Uh, easy Sparky, is there a shortage of drone support, drone companies, pilots? Would this be a good time to get into doing this, or are there enough doing it now already? <laughs> um, uh, there's no shortage of them. There's a shortage of the ones that do it really well, because I think a lot of people have jumped into it because it is so easy to get into. Um, the hard part is being able to get drones that, that we can use. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to have. Um, you know, a DJI Pro that will do 4K, but there's another thing to be able to, to uh, have a drone that's big enough to be able to put uh, um, a 6K camera on. They're heavy. Um, it's it's uh, not so much anymore with, with things like the Komodo and stuff like that, but still you have to have an octocopter and things like that that can raise it. The, the Inspire 2 
is probably the bare minimum of, of sort of what you're able to do, um, you know, with an X7 on it. And uh, you can't really go into it with, uh, even, even using the, um, uh, these racing drones that we're using right now, which is so lightweight, uh, they, they, uh, um, the quality that you're getting out of them is not, uh, is not up to the 4K. Uh, it, the, the resolution is there, but the, the, uh, um, uh, the codec isn't there to be able to use uh, with some of the stuff that we're doing. So um, it's one thing to be able to fly them. It's another thing to uh, finish the ground school, get your licensing and be able to get permits and stuff like that. There's always three people there. Um, there's a pilot, there's a camera operator, and there's a spotter. Yeah, to watch it with the naked yeah. eye. Yeah, keep eye contact. It's not a one-man show. Um, I've done, uh, I, I, I did the paperwork so I could fly drones because I was being told, no, you can't afford it, you can't afford it. So I bought a drone myself and flew it for a couple of movies. Um, but it is, it, it does, uh, there's a lot of safety concerns and things that, that have to go with it. So you have to be well up on that. So yeah, if, if you're keen on being a, a camera operator and, and things like this, the camera operators have to be part of the union um, uh, that are operating the cameras. Um, you know, so, uh, so it's not as easy as just buying a drone and throwing it up in the air and being able to shoot pictures with it. Um, um, and again, you, we're getting closer and closer to the actors with these drones and shooting scenes with them. Um, you know, it can get so, dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. John 42, uh, what happened to the wrench that you and uh, uh, Dan Shea as Siler? Somebody swiped it. Somebody swiped it. We went to, to find it one day and it was gone. And so we, that's when it, when it stopped being used was the day it was stolen. Um, <gasps> so yeah, we, uh, for years and years and years, we, we uh, sort of, uh, I kept it in my office or Dan had a hold of it after he'd used it. And it was always something that we did. That was a joke prop that a friend of mine had given me um, uh, about something else. I, oh, it wasn't know, a real wrench. It was a real wrench. I it thought was it was a, real. Yeah, okay. Was, but he gave it to me as a joke. Uh, and I brought it in one day and said, we're using this. Because of the big lugs that are on the... Uh, um, <laughs> it's Stargate yeah. size. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jeez. I was under the impression that someone said, no more. Stop using it. And oh. so that's not true. Oh, wow. Well, it was, uh, it got stolen and it was like, oh, okay, well, too bad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, David Stula, you directed one of my favorite Travelers episodes, Room 101. How was directing Travelers different f from, for example, Continuum, which also deals with uh, with time travel? Um, You're back uh, with Brad again, which yeah, I'm sure was wonderful. I, I loved, uh, Travelers is one of my favorite episodes, uh, my, my favorite shows that I, I've directed. Um, and it was a lot of it was the shooting style. The shooting style was set up um, in the pilot uh, by an amazing DP, an amazing director that, uh, that uh, did that and sort of set a style that uh, Andy and uh, Will, Amanda and I followed because it was so beautiful. You could shoot through things. You could shoot. It was, it was um, you know, reflection based. It was a lot of uh, long lens stuff through things. And um you know, so well, as we, we got into that, uh, James, who was the production designer at the beginning of the, the episode, sort of said, you know, let's put these cages on uh, on water. Again, so you get this beautiful reflection and stuff. So we, we waterproofed the, uh, the room that we were in and, and uh, um, put them in there. And I got to say, that cast was amazing. Um, uh, Eric McCormick was a dream to work with. Um, uh, and the rest of the cast too. They were, it was so nice to work with that uh, uh, that cast and that idea. The idea of time travel was uh, interesting because it was very, um, very uh, um, ground-based. It wasn't, oh, we can just flick back and forth. So if something we didn't like, we can change, you know, that kind of stuff. It was, we're committed to this by the time they get here and, and, um, the limit of the knowledge they would have gleaned from, you know, Facebook or whatever they were gleaning it from, um, uh, uh, as it shows up in so many of the things that Mackenzie, um, you know, had this, this um, persona that wasn't hers um, mm -hmm. in there um, that was, that was erroneously uh, given to, uh, to the traveler that came in, you know, and, uh, and so there's all those things, which I thought, I thought it was a brilliant uh, way of dealing with time travel. Um, 
and not to the uh, not the kind of time travel we always had trouble you know with with uh in sanctuary we talked about it a lot too about how much are we going to be able to do this because if we can do this this uh, uh if we can move in time the way that that uh that uh, druid trans uh you know is able to teleport himself it's a superpower that you can't that it's it's uh, it's so powerful that you can't get around it sometimes you know time travel is a is a massive superpower that is just uh, you're too powerful you're a superman yeah once you give it it's it's my dad's issue when we watch star trek you know oh it's a horrible situation well you know they can just fly around the sun a few times and undo it you know yeah. and that's his answer for everything you you have to be careful when you give your characters the ability to undo something yeah, you so, let Lois Lane die, and then you can bring her back to life by... by flying around the planet. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Uh, last question from the fans. Teresa uh, uh, McAllister. Were there any guest stars that you would love to have made as regulars in any of the Stargate shows? If it were up to you. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's there's so many of them that, that uh, you know, what's funny is is the, the story about Ryan Robbins. Um, yes. Yes. You know, um, and I, I've, I've told you this story, uh, before, um, uh, uh, and I, I, I have to get the names right in this. So, um, oh, so the scene where, um, where Ryan is running through the gate. Laden Radim, Yeah. The Janai, right. the, they're bugging uh, out. And so, uh, the end of the script said, um, you know, he gets shot as he's going through the gate. Um, uh, so we know that he's not going to be a threat, you know. Um, uh, and and uh, we enjoyed working with him so much. And that was one of the first times I'd ever worked with Ryan. Um, and it was like, this is great. Why are we killing him? You know, and so in a conversation with Brad, very, very quick conversation with Brad, I said, well, let's, you know, let's not. I'll just work it so that he doesn't, he may or may not have gotten shot, you know. And so as we're doing this, I looked at the guy beside him and I said, are you okay if we squib you? And he said, sure. And so the guy that was beside him gets shot. Now, the guy that was beside him was Corey Monteith. I didn't know that at the time. That's right, Corey. But, but I killed Corey Monteith instead of Ryan Roberts. Man, oh man. So, and he yeah. went down to LA for Glee. Yeah. So and may he rest in peace. Yeah. Wow. What's... Um, but uh, yeah, that was uh, that was it. Um, I really uh, there there are so many people like uh, Richard Kind was so much fun to work with. <laughs> Here I come. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I was so glad I got to do both of them because it was just it was like wow, you know. Um, uh, and uh, um, Richard Kind has my favorite. If I may insert my favorite line from an, all of Atlantis. Well, you know the the lame don't walk, but they crawl a lot faster. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Um, uh, there, there were so many people that, that it would have been nice to be able to hold on to for longer yeah. and things like that. But, but uh, um, uh, I'm surprised actually looking back on it, the people that we had on the show that that uh, that, that you know have have uh, gone off and done their own shows and stuff like this. And and um, uh, when we had them, they were there for a line or two. You know. Yeah. Um, which is really interesting to me. Lou Gossett Jr. I love Bo as the general, but yeah. I can't help but sometimes think, because uh, what would it have been like for Lou Gossett Jr. to have been Landry? I mean, he's just such a presence. Yeah. Yeah. I, Landry was so uh, underspoken, um, you know, by Bo that, that, uh, that it would have been, it would have changed again the dynamic of that. Uh, you know, it, it's so interesting because you had Rick, you had Don, and you have Rick, and and it's like uh, to to have somebody that comes in that's just that's that's very level, um, you know, uh, was a great contrast to what we'd already had, you know, with with this. Um, and uh, and Lou would have been it would have been a whole different thing there there's a there's a command to him that that uh, exactly uh, that Bo didn't have to raise his voice to have command yeah and I think that that uh, Lou would have been able to raise it and still maintain that same kind of command you know uh, stance but yeah Martin this has been 
fantastic and i really appreciate you taking the time to come on oh that's an hour and a half Holy i God. know isn't that extraordinary i would <laughs> love to have you back um one of the things that this is that the the show is designed to do is be the uh, a place where people can go on youtube where it's capturing our show is capturing the oral history of stargate for future generations for uh not just uh, for a limited number of countries or for a a a, a an annual fee, but for any Stargate fan out there, past, present, who hasn't discovered it yet, and for free. Um, and so I really appreciate you taking the time. I talked to you at GateCon a couple of years ago about doing a, uh, a director's reunion. And yeah. Zoom has come along and presented a new opportunity. Uh, would you, because you know them all. Yeah. When do you, uh, January? What, what, what month should we, should we, you know, look look toward for this. Do you think? Because I would think December would be insane. If we have a second surge, uh, oh, that's in that, true. <laughs> it's when to do it. You know, because then we'll all be not working. Um, yeah, my schedule is starting to fill up in a big way uh, into the new year right now. Uh, thankfully, um, yeah. Uh, I know Amanda is tied up for uh, for a while um, uh, with the show she's doing right now. She's show running a show right now um, uh, as a producer director. And just uh, killing, killing it. it. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, you know, there's uh, Will and Peter. Um, I, I, I know Will is working on something, and Peter was just finishing another movie. Uh, it, it would be interesting to see Andy's, Andy's series. He's show running a series as well uh, called Family Law that uh, um, it's wrapping up before December, but. Uh, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to do, certainly get a, get a hold of him. Um, be kind of fun to have Jonathan Glasner in something like that as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure Jonathan, you know, if we can get Brad and Rob, I wouldn't mind having the creators in as well. Just have a, a great big hoopla. Rob did, um, you know, did some giant episodes in, in uh, um, as well. He sure did. So, yeah. um, all right, we'll, uh, we'll have to talk about it. I'm in. Thank you so much, my friend, for joining me. This this was a treat. Oh, and I look forward to having you back. Absolutely. You take care of yourself, okay? Absolutely. Bye-bye. Be well, Martin. Martin Wood, director and producer. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, it's uh, <laughs> he's hard to beat, let me tell you. Thank you for uh, joining us and sticking around for uh, this show. Uh, we have... Who we got? How many have we got in here? 154 concurrent viewers. Thank you for uh, helping us to uh, bring the show where it has come. I have fan art to share with you. Mr. Max Becko submitted this to me. He said, this specific piece I chose has lots of meaning to me. I personally don't like my art. I don't think I'm good at all. Uh, Max, uh, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he says, but there are some people that do, and one that really liked it so much that he recently discovered the Stargate franchise and sent me an art commission, my very first, and I made him this, showing the hard-edged Jack O'Neill from the feature film with the gate looming behind him. I wanted to showcase Jack, but also the gate, the thing that made me fall in love with the franchise. So, Max, thank you for submitting that. And if you have uh, your own artwork or photos of something physical that you made, something like that, submit that to dialthegateshow at gmail.com. And I want to appreciate the other artists who have submitted. I'm still catching up on emails as well. Big thanks to Linda, the gate gabber, for all of her uh, promotional work in the show. Summer, Ian, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy, you guys uh, have been fantastic. Next weekend, we have pre-recorded episodes. I recorded them this past week. They are both nearly two hours long. Robert C. Cooper, executive producer, writer, director of uh, Stargate. He was co-executive, uh, he was co-creator of Atlantis and Universe alongside Brad Wright. This is a two-hour special that uh, you will not want to miss. And so that's going to be airing uh, Halloween, October 31st at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Then we have Andy Frizzell, the Wraith Queen on Atlantis. Nearly two hours with Andy. I've already posted a preview of that, uh, so you can see that on the channel now. She will be, she's been pre-recorded, and she will be uh, live at 3 p.m. Pacific 
time, the streaming live. So I hope to be in there in the chat. Uh, my schedule is still still working it out for next week, but they will be premiering um, uh, the the pre. I'm trying to figure out how to put it. It's a live stream, so they will be they will be airing on YouTube. You won't just be able to play and go through the the whole thing. So it will be actively starting at those specific times. For Rob, it will be one o'clock. Uh, Pacific and Andy it will be three o'clock Pacific. Is that all that I have? Oh, one last thing. Before I let you go, if you like what you've seen in this episode, I would appreciate it if you'd click the like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience. And please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click that subscribe icon. If you plan to watch live, I recommend giving the bell icon a click so you'll be the first to know of any schedule changes. And bear in mind, clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels to help promote both. Thanks again to director, producer Martin Wood for joining us for this fantastic episode. Martin's just one of my favorite people, and uh, he's, as you saw, a wealth of knowledge. And hopefully we'll have him back very soon to uh, share more uh, stories as we go through the franchise. I'm David Reed for Dial the Gate. Thank you so much for watching. It means a great deal to me uh, to have you here, and we'll see you on the other side.